History is doomed to repeat itself and today's subject is no different. Lost sources, as we've seen in the likes of Mayapuri and Goyanya, are easily mistaken for scrap material, leading to accidental exposure to workers. The case would be similar in Istanbul, Turkey in 1998. I'm going to rate this here 5 on the paint tinted plane difficult disaster scale, and here too on the historical legacy scale. As I don't know about you, but I hadn't actually heard of the event until one day when I was browsing the IAEA publications list. This video, as such, is unsurprisingly going to follow the IAEA report rather closely. If you want more detail, then feel free to check it out, and the link is in the description. Cobalt-60 teletherapy units can play a vital role in the treatment of cancer. However, the radioisotope has a relatively short half-life of just over five years. This means that a teletherapy machine needs its cobalt source to be replaced every once in a while, as its beam of penetrating gamma radiation deteriorates and as such an industry in replacement and maintenance is created. Turkey was no exception for this and as such multiple specialist companies operated swapping radioactive sources and maintaining teletherapy equipment. During the 1990s around 40 or so radiotherapy centres existed in Turkey all of which needed maintenance and source replacements at one time or another. One such company operated in Ankara and would cause contamination in Istanbul due to storage of three such used cobalt sources. The company was licensed by the Turkish Atomic Energy Authority or TAEIC to import, transport and re-export radioactive sources which was required by law. But before we go into the timeline of events, let's look at the cobalt source and what it does. Cobalt-60 teletherapy units are manufactured with sources containing a high activity level of around 185 terabecules. This is to help keep the unit in action for as long as possible whilst also not having excessively long treatment times. As mentioned earlier, cobalt has a half-life of just over five years. And because of this, the teletherapy machine would eventually take excessively long periods of time to treat the patient. This necessitates the removal and replacement of the source. But it's not like you can just pull it out and chuck it in the bin like a battery. Plain difficult does not condone throwing batteries in general waste. Please dispose of responsibly. You see, even though it's no longer ideal for a teletherapy machine, the source can still be very deadly with an activity of around 3 terabecules. But sometimes this number can be much higher if the machine itself has failed or has been decommissioned. The radioactive material was in the form of cobalt-60 grains contained inside an international standard capsule. To undertake a swap over of sources, an exchange container was employed. It was designed to be connected to the teletherapy head for shielded replacement. The container had a cylinder for removal and installation of sources. It had a retractable drawer that allowed two sources to be temporarily held within. This was to allow the spent source to be removed via the cylinder while still shielding the operator from the new and old cobalt. Once the old source was removed, the drawer could be closed, allowing the new source to be installed into the teletherapy head. The exchanger couldn't be closed with the two sources inside, meaning it was only designed to transport one item. After completion of the exchange, the cylinder and drawer assembly are secured and a steel cover plate is bolted on. For transport, the cover plates were fitted with wire seals and the whole exchange container is then packed inside a transport package which consists of an inner wooden crate and an outer metal case. This brings us on to the 27th of December 1993 and one of the many specialist teratherapy maintenance companies applying for a license from TAIC to export free used cobalt sources to the USA for disposal. The free containers had an officially claimed activity of 6.446 and 41.8 terabecules respectively. They were packaged inside source exchanges which were in turn within their transport packages. On the 6th of May 1994 permission was granted after radiation measurements were taken by officials. Istanbul Harbour's Customs Directorate was informed on the 12th of May 1994 that export permission had been granted. What was strange was that the export didn't go ahead and the sources were stored in Ankara at the company's storage site. 
The state licensing authority, TAIC, was not informed, meaning the storage was not known of. Not much else would happen to the sources until February 1998, when the company shipped two of the three to their site in Istanbul. Upon reaching their destination, the company planned to store them in a general warehouse. The total claimed activity of the two containers was 52.4 terabecules. After some time, space became available in the warehouse and the packages were moved to empty premises adjoining the warehouse. What is bizarre is that this was a shop and had no windows and only metal shutters and the door was unsecured. The storage location was in Kukukcek Maje district of Istanbul. This was obviously a very good and safe decision, but unlike many other stories I've covered like this, the sources were not stolen but instead were just left in the shop when it was sold on to new customers. On the 8th of December 1998, the packages were sold by the new owners of the warehouse for roughly $30 as scrap metal to two brothers who lived in the same district. They took the scrap, aka radioactive sources, home for dismantling. A couple of days later, the items were moved from the house to one of the brothers' father-in-law's houses, where an open area yard was opposite. It was there that the dismantling of the exchange containers took place, one of which had their drawer removed, and one of the three men reached their hand inside to have a feel. During this dangerous operation, passers-by looked on. Both sources and their exchange containers were then transported back to the original house where they were placed in a yard next door used for scrap metal storage. At about 9am on the 13th of December 1998, the dismantling continued. Removal of the brass collars at the top of the units became an issue, which was resolved by cutting with an acetylene torch, revealing lead parts of the shielding. The containers were rolled over and at this time one of the sources was thought to have exited their exchange containers. Whilst all this was happening again, passers-by watched on. On the same day, the first signs of radiation exposure were experienced by the three men, with the usual symptoms of vomiting and nausea. By the evening, many of the onlookers in the scrapyard also began to feel unwell. The first of the affected went to a local health clinic where they were treated for suspected food poisoning. This seemed to help but they were discharged to get better at home. On the 17th of December, the man who put their hand inside the exchange unit started to experience reddening of the tips of his two fingers. Not a good sign. Parts of the lead shielding and parts of the exchange units were sent to a scrap metal smelting facility. This happened when the owners who were seeking medical care were away from the yard. Luckily, one of the sources in the drawer did not get smelted and stayed on site. However, anything else got turned into recycled material. Two of the people started to feel the effects of radiation sickness went to a larger hospital to seek medical attention. Luckily, after some questioning from a doctor, ARS was finally suspected on the 8th of January 1999. By the afternoon, blood tests for the two and six others were arranged. The authorities were informed and at 3pm, initial surveys were conducted at the scrapyard's entrance and they detected something. By 4.30pm, the yard was evacuated and the area around the yard was also cordoned off to allow authorities to plan what to do next. One of the cylindrical drawer assemblies from one of the exchange containers was seen on the ground in the scrapyard. To collect the source, a shielded container was made from lead bricks inside a steel container and placed on the bed of a truck, and a grab truck was used to pick up the material. As a credit to the operators, the item was collected on the first attempt, however dose rate surveys showed that there was more in the yard. Surveys showed high levels of activity under a pile of scrap metal, a mechanical grab was also used to slowly tackle the pile, but after each removal, the rate increased. This was due to the surrounding scrap acting as a radiation shield, and thus the more you remove, the more radiation gets out. A new shielded container was fabricated and mounted on the back of a truck, and another truck was used with a long boom arm with a dosimeter attached to the end of it. Ten teams of two were set up to recover the scrap for limited periods of time to reduce exposure. An individual dose 
constraint of two millisieverts was set, with the grab drivers limited to one millisievert. Each team was only to have one go, meaning 10 attempts to find the source. However, at the end of the run, not all had been removed. Another attempt per team was needed, and after reviewing doses, another attempt could go ahead. And after another four goes, the source was found and safely placed inside the storage container. Out of the recovery team, an average of 1.15 millisieverts was experienced with the highest dose of 5.47 millisieverts, with the next highest at 2.05. The highest dose was a senior member of the health physics team who undertook the initial dose survey. Surveys of the scrapyard showed no more activity, meaning it was now clear. In total, only one of the sources was actually found with an activity of 3.3 terabecules. But what was strange was where was the other source? Scarily, this was never found. Searches at the smelting factory and iron ore wire produced from the scrap metal showed no activity. Essentially, the Cobalt 60 from the second exchanger had vanished into thin air, or more likely, it was never actually put into the carrier. The serial numbers of the sources were destined to be deported back to America, did not match the numbers on the company records, so who knows where the missing source went. On Tuesday the 12th of January 1999, the Turkish authorities sent an official request for medical assistance from the IAEA. The next day, the evaluation of the 15 patients, IAEA experts, was completed and a report was sent to TAIC, 10 of which were exposed for a significant amount of time, between 2 and 6 hours. For patients 1 to 5, the estimated doses were around 3 gray each, with patient 6 estimated at 2 gray, while all the other persons for whom analyses were undertaken, estimated doses were below 1 gray. For comparison, a whole dose of 3 gray can cause death, although people have survived higher. Let's look at the medical aspects of the event. At the beginning of hospital treatment on the 12th of January 1999, Patients 1 to 5 showed life-threatening conditions, necessitating immediate blood transfusions. They were given bone marrow biopsies, showing hypocellular bone marrow, but within a week of treatment improvements were observed, while white blood cells going back to normal levels. Three of the original 10 were discharged on the 25th of January 1999. By the 24th of February 1999, all other patients were discharged, after a successful treatment of antibacterial, antiviral and antifungal drugs. The patients were monitored regularly throughout the year, with patients 1 to 5 having to take caution due to increased risk of infection. Remember the guy who put his hand inside a container to see what was inside? This would prove to have been a big mistake, as in April 1999, an x-ray examination of the right hand showed a slightly thinner bone tip. It was decided in July to amputate the tip of his finger, but as always, this was followed by an ulceration and necrosis requiring further treatment. The event caused much distress to the public, with it being rather unfairly compared to Chernobyl. The orphan source event altered the public psyche, leading to greater fears of radiological incidents, but did have a positive in raising awareness of the risks of improper handling of material. At the time of the event, the Turkish authorities did have emergency plans for radioactive contamination from outside of its borders, for example from a nuclear reactor failure, but it didn't have a plan for an incident within the country. Although the orphan source proved to be dangerous to the affected persons, it could have been much worse if the Cobalt 60 made its way to the foundry, as well that could have made a much bigger mess. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a currently sunny southeastern corner of London, UK. Help the channel grow by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Check out my Twitter for all sorts of photos, nods, and sods, as well as hints on future videos. I've got Patreon and YouTube membership as well, so if you fancy, check them out. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.